Welcome everyone to today's clean air webinar, what to do about poor air quality days. So good afternoon, my name is Julie Cusick and I am the communications and engagement coordinator for West Central Airshed Society and Alberta Capital Airshed. Today is the fourth in our clean air webinar series co-hosted by both, both organizations, and you can catch our previous webinars by heading to the respective websites of Alberta Capital Airshed and West Central Airshed Society and clicking under the news and events tab. So I'm sure you must recall a few years ago when we had that really dark orange sooty sky, right? That was a case of extremely poor air quality. And poor, poor air quality days due to wildfire smoke, human pollution, and other sources will continue to happen. And that's what we're here today to talk about, poor air quality days and what we can do about it. So to help us dive into these questions, we have three excellent speakers lined up. I'm quite excited for the day. We have Kim Menounos from Prince George Air Improvement Roundtable. You can give a little wave there, Kim, also known as PG Air. And Kim will kick off our event with a comparison between approaches to air quality monitoring in British Columbia and Alberta. She will also tell us about projects that PG Air has undertaken to mitigate the impacts of wildfire smoke in the area. Jill Bloor, give a little wave Jill, from the Calgary Region Airshed Zone or CRAS, will get into how their organization developed a guide to wildfire smoke for municipalities, community members, and others to use. Rounding out presentations will be Gary Redmond. Give a little wave there, Gary. Also from both West Central Airshed and Alberta Capital Airshed. And he will provide information about poor air quality events in the two airsheds. He will also propose opportunities for municipal and multi-stakeholder organizations to work together towards mitigating the human impacts of poor air quality event days in the region. So a couple of quick housekeeping pieces. We will have each of the panelists give a short presentation. As they present, you may have comments and you may have questions. That is fantastic. We like questions. So if you are joining us on Zoom, please use the Q&A function to input your question. And then I'll be going through that at the end to help facilitate our Q&A portion of the afternoon. If you are on Facebook Live, feel, please feel free to put it on the chat and I will uh, be able to see your question from there. If you have a comment to make or something, you know, you have an idea that you just really wanna share with the other people on the call, please use the comment box. Um, that way the questions and comments um, are easier for me to tease apart. Uh, the final piece that I'd like to note is that this webinar is being recorded and will be shared to both the Alberta Capital Airshed and West Central Airshed Society websites and social media channels. So with that, let's get started. Kim is joining us from Prince George, BC. As I mentioned before, she is the manager in the Northern and Interior region of the Fraser Basin Council and has worked for FBC or the Fraser Basin Council for over five years. Under the air quality program, Kim manages the Prince George Air Improvement Roundtable, PG Air, and the Prince George Air Quality Monitoring Group. And I will post links to that organization in the chat as, as we get going here. In her work with PG Air, Kim has gained a strong appreciation for inclusive community and stakeholder engagement processes. Kim believes that broad support for initiatives such as air quality improvements depend on commitments from all sectors. We couldn't agree more. Uh, Kim holds a Bachelor of Science in Forestry and a Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Studies. Welcome, Kim, and thank you for coming today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'll start by sharing my screen and then um, introduce you to PG Air. Sorry, small screen here. Great, so I presume everybody can see my screen okay? Terrific. Well, so I just wanna start by saying thank you so much for having us. PG Air is um, really excited to be able to participate in this kind of event and share knowledge across jurisdictions. Um, I do wanna clarify though, I, uh, I am not at all qualified to do a comparison between British Columbia and Alberta, although I do have lots of personal opinions and, and observations. I'm gonna just focus today on um, 
about a PG air and what we do and how we sort of mitigate those um, air quality events related to wildfire smoke. Um, so first I'll tell you a little bit about PG air, our role and the work that we do, some of the trends and findings locally here, uh, and some of the air quality management in, in Prince George and in particular as it relates to, to wildfire smoke. So PG air is a group that uh, fosters public awareness and engagement surrounding air quality, encourages collaboration and information sharing between stakeholders, supports research and monitoring, and recommends strategies to continually improve air quality and mitigate impacts of poor air quality. PG Air has, was established in 2008, so we're about 12 years old, and is kind of a leading airshed group in, in the province of BC in that we uh, enshrine the sort of that round table format. I lost my ability to. Oh, there we go. Um, in, we enshrine this, this roundtable format that engages uh, stakeholders from across all sectors within the community. Uh, so local government is represented here, um, industry, the health uh, authority, our, our local health authority is called Northern Health, it covers the entire northern part of the province. We have um, PACHA, the People's Action Committee for Healthy Air is our sort of local citizens action group, and then a Chamber of Commerce and the Fraser Basin Council, my sort of home organization, is also a, a member at this table. In Prince George, we have experienced historically high levels of particulate matter, in some cases uh, the top of the worst list. Um, we've made significant improvements over the years, but PM 2.5 is still very much a major concern within our community. And despite uh, the this these other um, pollutants being listed here as priority pollutants, and they are pollutants of concern, they actually aren't identified in our strategic plan as having any management actions associated with them. So um, it's a, it, I'm gonna go on, um, explain a little bit more about the, the monitoring and the relationship between these pollutants and PG air, but I, I won't dwell on that too much considering PM 2.5 being the major component of wildfire smoke. So what we do understand, and this is one of the um, benefits of the roundtable format is the close relationships amongst all stakeholders. This is a project that was conducted by uh, our, the, air quality team at UNBC, University of Northern British Columbia. Uh, Dr. Peter Jackson and Braden Nielsen led this project on behalf of the city of Prince George, PG Air and Northern Health. They, what they did is just update our, our emissions inventory, but um, for a small group like PG Air, who, where we have a, a limited budget, a project like that can be extremely expensive and difficult to, um, to coordinate. However, with the help of UNBC, we have this fantastic picture of what our sources of PM 2.5 were between 2000 and the, the source at the bottom here is a, a little bit wonky. The, it was between 2016 and 2018. Um, and the reason that those uh, years were selected is that they were absent of significant um, wildfire smoke. So the other year, more recent years were so impacted by wildfire smoke that they were excluded from this study. The bars in, show you uh, the, the left hand uh, axis there. Those are neighborhoods or sort of smaller, you know, um, more micro scale um, neighborhoods around Prince George. So starting from the north and going south, north being um, Cranbrook Hill, North Nechaco, the center in, in the middle there is the downtown area. That is the, we call it the bowl because topographically speaking, Prince George was um, thousands of years ago, essentially a lake with some higher elevation uh, upland areas surrounding it. So pollutants tend to be trapped in the bowl area during winter inversions and um, events where um, there's significant pollution coming from the bowl area. Um, and then, like I said, moving south to the BCR South and, and airport. So you can see that, um, and these are all sources of two point, PM 2.5. So we, we also in that same project 
received data about those other pollutants, but this one is, um, I, I wanted to share this considering um, the blue, we call that background sources. And essentially that includes wildfire smoke, the probably majority of the, that is wildfire smoke. And we consider that background um, PM 2.5 to be in the unmanageable realm. So in the, all of the other sources, heating and industrial, on road, mobile, as in vehicles, and then road dust, we consider those manageable because we can work with those agencies and partners to sort of advance best available technologies or strategies to reduce pollutants coming from, from those sources. So as you know, uh, wildfire smoke is, so um, maybe we consider it background or natural source. It's a natural source that is uh, unmanageable because it's not coming, A, not coming from within our air shed and isn't related to specifically to human activities that are, are going on in our air shed. Um, so an air shed group like ours we don't have any legal jurisdiction or authority. All of our work is, uh, is accomplished through consensus and stakeholder engagement. But we do acknowledge that wildfire smoke contributes substantially to our local air pollution. So in terms of uh, our, what the tools are available to an airshed group like ours, um, we have legislative tools like our local clean air bylaw enacted in 2010 by the city of Prince George. Uh, we use a lot of research, education and outreach, heavier on the education and outreach, um, mainly because funding research is a pretty big ticket item. Um, most airshed groups in British Columbia, maybe compared to Alberta, aren't necessarily well funded. So um, they tend to be arrangements between local government and with help from the province. Uh, while the province does remain responsible for um, sort of the, the higher level monitoring, but we also um, have a working group that is a little separate from Prince George Air Improvement Roundtable. We call it the monitoring working group. So they do, uh, they are, um, tasked with so sorry, supporting and, um, and operating a monitoring system within the city. And then reporting back the data collected there to the province and to groups like UNBC to analyze and um, help inform uh, any of those sort of management actions that we can identify through um, our planning processes. And then finally, and but probably the most important I would say is collaborative action, which really is there to harness the power of collaborative process for the greatest impact. So our clean air bylaw um, might be, uh, I'm not sure how prevalent clean air bylaws are across the province of British Columbia, but ours in particular regulates the use of wood burning appliances to meet emission standards. So while we don't limit folks from installing wood burning appliances, they do need to meet um, current emission standards. The bylaw prohibits open burning and li limits recreational fires. So when I say open burning, I mean burning yard waste or construction debris, for example, or even uh, we have a lot of, in Prince George, we have a lot of open forest area, undeveloped area. And sometimes there's some sort of thinning that needs to be done to maintain a, a wildfire urban interface sort of safety zone there. Um, and that debris is, is prohibited from being burnt. So other solutions are, are sought through that mechanism. And then recreational fires. I mean, in the North here, um, fires are a pretty big part of our, our culture and you know, regular activities. Um, so those are the size of those fires is, are regulated by the cleaner bylaw. Um, dust control practices, for example, uh, you know, typically wildfire smoke may not be invading the city early in the season when, um, when dust control measures are being enacted. Um, but if there's any overlap or when there are clean air advi or sorry, um, air quality advisories, which is that last bullet there, um, an air quality advisory is issued by the province and the Ministry of sorry, the Ministry of Environment and um, our health authority, which then limits any activities doing dust control um, for the risk of um, creating more fugitive dust. Um, 
during a, an air quality advisory, additionally, unless it's your only source of heat, the use of wood burning appliances is prohibited. And it also, um, sorry, one more point about the use of wood burning appliances. There are no outdoor wood boilers allowed within the city of Prince George under the Clean Air Bylaw. As I mentioned, um, outreach and education are, are some primary um, activities uh, and mitigation opportunities when it comes to wildfire smoke. We use, we have a series of creative videos on our YouTube site, which are well, any of you is welcome to download and promote or use those in your own air quality uh, outreach programs. They're there for um, intended for, for public use or for to support other groups like ours. Uh, we use social media pretty heavily and uh, the subject of a lot of our posts last summer, for example, were sharing information about um, where about wildfire smoke, where folks could go to get more information or simply sharing that specific information on the Facebook page, such as firesmoke.ca. Um, the British Columbia Center for Disease Control issued uh, information bulletins, as well as uh, traditional media, our website, and then um, linking to provincial resources like the map at the bottom. This is a, a, an image, I'm going to go a little bit quicker because I'm going to run out of time here, but this is an image of the network that I mentioned earlier throughout the city of Prince George. And that center one at Prince George Plaza, as I'm showing you here, is actually the only PM 2.5 monitor at the provincial level uh, within our city. However, as I mentioned, uh, UNBC is a close partner and have been are carrying out a, um, a research project to co-locate or to, to look at the efficacy of uh, small monitors to support um, sort of monitoring throughout a, a larger area, um, not necessarily as um, robust in terms of uh, data collection, the, the way that monitor, the monitors are at the provincial level, but are really accessible to the public um, so this is a great example of using citizen science to support, um, you know, monitoring needs and to reduce some of the gaps that are especially seen by wildfire smoke. And then finally, as I mentioned, the uh, collaborative action um, is probably the most effective way to mitigate um, air pollution in, in any community. And uh, this is just a, a sort of an image from our most recent uh, strategic plan just last year finalized at the end of last year um, and our first goal there is to develop and implement an air quality management plan um, and uh, we we have been operating under strategic plans for the last two sort of periods um, since 2016 when our last air quality management plan uh, wrapped up so we're looking at um, going through the exercise to develop a new one and then finally, uh, some links and resources that uh, might be informative to you or that you could follow us on Facebook. That's always a um, very um, terrific way to engage and interact there. And then a link to that UNBC Purple Air project map um, so that you can see real-time monitoring of um, air quality PM 2.5 within the city of Prince George. And that's all I have for you. Shall I stop sharing, Julie? Yeah, that would be great. And thank you, Kim, for that presentation and those those four really solid, you know, solid tools that that you went through with with us. So before we get to our next presenter, I'd like to take a moment for a quick commercial break and to let you know about a webinar that Alberta Capital Airshed hosted last summer in June of 2021, all about wildfire smoke and the environmental and health impacts. The panelists for that webinar included someone from the forestry perspective, from the pediatric um, health perspective, as well as the data perspective. If you would like to catch a recording of that webinar, you can find it on our YouTube channel. And again, I will link to that in all of the comments as well. You can find that on our websites. Um, our second presenter is Jill Bloor, who is joining us from Calgary, Alberta. 
Jill has been the executive director at CRAS or Calgary Region Airshed Zone since April 2008. She came to the organization after many years in the social service sector, all with nonprofit organizations. She has a BA from York University and a Master's of Nonprofit Administration from North Park University in Chicago. She is a registered social worker. Jill brings her experience in program development, conflict resolution, and organizational development, to name a few, to CRAS. So with that, welcome, Jill. And we will get Russ to share your presentation. Thank you, Russ, in the background, helping us out. And over to you, Jill. Thank you very much, Julie. Uh, and thank you, Russ, for uh, advancing this. So um, I'm going to focus on the Community Guide to Wildfire Smoke and Health that uh, the organization's partners and members develop next. Thank you. So um, CRAS is uh, located down there in the southern part of Alberta. We have been in operation since 2007. This is our 15th year. We have 1.8 million people in our region. Uh, and we are funded partially from the government of Alberta to operate monitoring stations and membership fees. Next. So the Community Guide to Wildfire Smoke and Health, um, as many people in Alberta know, over the past few years, we have experienced increased smoke exposure because of the severe wildfires going on in other parts of North America, especially. The aim of this guide was to provide consistent Alberta specific messaging. Uh, a lot of resources were compiled into one spot uh, and it's information for um, municipalities, industries, schools, organizations, sports organizations, or just the public. It was quite interesting to find out, I think it was 2013 or 14 when we had one of our first ex uh, experiences with wildfire smoke, that some of our member organizations didn't have a policy on exposure for their outside workers. Next. So this is just a timeline. So 2017, uh, the original guide was uh, developed by Alberta Health Services, City of Calgary and CRAS. In 2020, we, the committee was set up a working group to revise that. And what I'm gonna go over today is the finalized version of the Community Guide to Wildfire Smoke and Health, Health Effects and Exposure Reduction Resources. Next. So these are the topics. I'm not going to go through each one, uh, but these are the topics that are in the guide. And I, we believe it is very comprehensive. I think some of the interesting parts uh, for some of our members were the AQHI and the clean air spaces. Next. So some of the resources that are in the guide relate to particulate matter, uh, other air pollutants, the color of smoke, air quality monitoring, all kinds of monitoring that are, is done, uh, a view on air quality from Alberta Health Services, some mental health links and services, and AQHI-based response templates. Next. Uh, there's a bit on the Blue Sky Canada. There's some social media uh, opportunities there. How to create a clean air room, HVAC standards. We get a lot of questions on which you know systems the best, which portable air cleaner is the best. We don't recommend one over another. Uh, cleaner air spaces in, or shelter in places. That's really important to some of our municipalities, and of course. Funding. How can we find funds to support, um, you know, clean air spaces, that type of thing. Uh, next. So this is a uh, template example that was developed from the committee. So as you can see, uh, it talks about um, at-risk population, general population, and what the health messages are.
the AQ, AQHI is available at that website down below. Next. So, oh, I'm really quick. <laughs> The review, uh, the next steps that will happen is one, the guide itself will be unveiled at our AGM on uh, Tuesday, June the 7th. And uh, Tanya Carlson, our engagement program manager, will be going into more depth on what is in the guide and how to access it and uh, pieces in it. Uh, and then in September, it will be shared with our members and be posted on our website. Then in September, they will review um, the wildfire season that will have just passed. We are in wildfire now. Uh, there'll be an annual review of the guide starting in February of next year. And if it needs to be, it will be updated at that time. We believe this guide will be a living document that we will continue to update, uh, take resources out if they're not available anymore, put new resources in. Uh, and in 2023, we are looking um, for, we will be looking for funding on how to create a website or for the creation of a website um, to deal with just the guide and any other information on uh, wildfire smoke and the impact to health. Next. This list of contributors were on that smoke working group and gave enormous amount of time and effort into the development of the guide. So Alberta Environment and Parks, Alberta Health Services, Calgary Emergency Management Agency, CD Nova, City of Chestermere, Department of Indigenous Services Canada, Foothills County Emergency Services, Lafarge Canada, Millennium EMS Solutions, Parks Canada, Ted Sutton, Town of Black Diamond and the Town of Canmore. And Without all of these members and what they brought to the table, there would be no guide. Uh, CRAS is truly dependent on all of our volunteer uh, on the committees and these members. Next. So this is just some of our uh, social media and our website where you can find us. Tanya does a blog and there's some information there that's really uh, interesting and informative. Next. Here's there another one. I think that might be it. Oh, that is the last one. I was much quicker, Julie. You were so quick. I didn't even have time to message you a, a time warning. So uh, well done, Jill. And so great. I'm. Uh, I, you know, I'm looking forward to when, you know, the, the new wildfire, wildfire guide comes out. Um, looks like your, your AGM will be quite interesting on June 7th. And then people have something, your members have something to look forward to in September. So I did put a link to Kraz in the chats as well as to Facebook if you want to learn more. In our final commercial break of the day, I'd like you all, I'd like to invite all of you to our next clean air webinar, which will take place between noon and 1 p.m. Edmonton time on June 20th. The topic will be exploring the relationship between climate change and air quality. Presenters will include David Dodge from Green Energy Futures, Andrew Reed from the city of Edmonton, and once again, Gary Redmond from Alberta Capital Airshed and West Central Airshed Society. The registration link is now live, which will be posted to the chat and comments. You can also look for it in the coming days on our website and social media channels. So with that, our final presenter of the day, Gary Redmond, is the executive director of both Alberta Capital Airshed and West Central Airshed Society here in Alberta. But today he is calling in from the calling in from Battery on the banks of Signal Hill in Newfoundland. We appreciate you calling in from across the other side of the country. When he's not in Newfoundland or other places, Gary provides leadership in air quality management within Alberta. With a background in emergency and environmental management spanning over 25 years, Gary has held senior positions within government, industry, and NGO sectors in Canada and abroad. Gary brings a passion of multi-stakeholder collaboration and community capacity in all that he does. And with that, over to you, Gary. Well, thanks, Julie. 
Um, I can I just ask, are you looking at my slides? Just want to confirm. Yeah, good. Thanks. Um, so uh, let me before I flip slides, let me just say thanks to the other speakers. I, I think it was great to have Kim here from PGR. Um, it is interesting to see uh, what I think are mostly similarities between the BC airshed and the Alberta airsheds. Uh, I, I, I think uh, uh, a lot of engagement and uh, the multi-stakeholder collaboration I think is great. It sounds like you do a little bit more work on management, air quality management stuff than perhaps some of our airsheds do. Uh, but I think it was very interesting. And then the clean air bylaw in Prince George is is fantastic. And I we don't have many of those in Alberta. And I think that's something that a few of us would like to see change. Um, and thanks very much to Jill. Uh, I think what Karaz has done is fantastic. It's a guide that uh, is really uh, the first in, uh, of its kind in Alberta. And it's very helpful to um, all of us airsheds in Alberta. So thanks. So what I thought I would do is actually, um, rather than, uh, I thought I'd pick one area within the airshed with the West Central airshed and just show a little bit about how wildfire smoke uh, affects it. So we're looking at a map um, sort of just Southwest of Edmonton and uh, South of Wadman Lake. And one of our, we have 12 monitoring stations in the West Central airshed. And that's one of them, the Genesee air monitoring station. Um, and so I just, grab some data quickly. This actually spans over 11 years and you'll see a lot of squiggly lines, I know, but these are sort of the criteria pollutants um, plus SO2 and this temperature at the bottom. So if we just highlight temperature there, where the temperature is hot, well, that is in fact summer months, of course. So if we go up to PM 2.5, what we see is that in the majority of summers, we're being hit with something with PM 2.5, and obviously that's wildfire smoke. Um, so it is, uh, it's, not a, it's not a once in a lifetime event. We're seeing wildfire smoke hit our monitors every summer. This is increasing um, across the board in our airshed and others. So the smoke comes from distant fires. We know that we um, can get uh, sort of slammed by air, uh, wildfire smoke from Northern Alberta, uh, certainly from British Columbia, uh, but we also get it locally. And so that event is just last year, um, very close to uh, the Genesee uh, monitoring station in, uh, in Evansburg. So I thought I would just um, touch on a few things. I'm not going to go into great detail, but just so that we sort of round out some of the information. I mean, what's what's in smoke? Well, we've talked about fine particulate matter or PM 2.5. There's a lot of other things, and I'm just going to sort of list them out here. I'm not going to talk about them, but it's important to note that um, particulate matter is not the only uh, concern in smoke, and there's a lot of dependencies on um, so the fuel type or what kind of um, trees and and uh, biological material being burnt, what's the moisture content, anyway, you can read all that. Um, but the distance from source is interesting too, because it can evolve, the smoke can evolve over time. They can have reactions in the atmosphere, it depends on how high it is. Uh, and so uh, wildfire smoke is not just um, a single entity, it can be very different in different places. Uh, a little graphic from the US EPA, um, that I think uh, many people will have seen, but if we just, the little pink dots are actually the, the PM, uh, the pink dots are the 2.5, the blue dots are the PM10, and they're superimposed on a follicle of human hair, just to see how actual small it is. And of course, the smaller it is, the, the, the further it goes into your respiratory system, and that in fact becomes uh, the health issue. Um, and you can see that again, as it moves along, it can actually um, change in its composition. So health impacts of smoke. Well, it depends on people, of course. So, uh, you know, most healthy people exposed to wood smoke, and I'm not, that's not wildfire, not necessarily big events, but just wood smoke generally, um, we, you know, will experience um, temporary impacts, transient symptoms, uh, recover quickly. So, so it's often seen as just a nuisance, particularly if you have a, a neighbor having a backyard fire. Um, but at-risk groups, and, and I've just listed some, I mean, there's many more, of course, but children, elderly, pregnant women, people with uh, heart and uh, lung diseases uh, are far more susceptible to wood smoke. And it, they don't need as much uh, wood smoke in the air to really affect their health. And it's important to note that even healthy people, 
uh, exposed to significant levels and or exposed for long periods of time can certainly see health impacts. We know this from previous events. Um, and so when there are significant events um, where the AQHI is 10 plus based on the PM level alone, uh, it, can, it absolutely does affect general population. I, I wanted to make the point that uh, there's many sources of wood smoke too. I know we're talking in this um, webinar about wildfire, um, but there is other sources of wood smoke, recreational and agricultural burning, et cetera, um, that can have some of the same impacts, particularly in close proximity. So community response. I have a slide just on some things that a community can do um, and something, I mean, some of these are, are what you've heard from, uh, from Kim and Jill already. So develop bylaws. Uh, so to allow fire bans during poor air quality days in the vast majority of Alberta municipalities, that is not available right now. The fire bans happen based on uh, safety, not air quality. And so it would be nice to see that um, increased or added. Um, designate public clean air shelters. We've heard about that, but there's a whole lot of different, so it's existing facilities within a community. Uh, obviously, you want to have uh, the proper filtration system. Um, you want to make sure that um, there, you know, how people move in and out is not causing more problems, bring smoke in with them. And you want to have monitoring uh, both outdoor, but also indoor in the public clean air shelters. Some people can't move, so long, long term care facilities, that sort of thing, we need to look at that within the community. Canceling outdoor events in uh, one of the bad event times in Edmonton, the professional football team, the Edmonton Elks, um, had an issue of whether to cancel the game or not. It went ahead, um, but there were pretty high levels of PM in the air that certainly could have affected the players and, and um, the fans. Uh, and I'll just, sorry, back up there just to say there are, like Alberta Soccer Association, we know already looks at AQHI and makes recommendations. It's not a uh, sort of a perfect system, but I believe it's an AQHI 7. Uh, they recommend the, the referee looks at uh, postponing the game, but sometimes they continue on. But I think there's opportunity there to look at that more. Uh, develop public communication for wildfire events. Obviously, there is a lot. I think what, what should be in there is a coordination between all the different agencies. So health, environment, air sheds, um, municipalities, making sure that the public are not confused uh, by differing messages that can go out. Uh, an evacuation plan uh, speaks mostly to smaller communities, um, but that what at what level really should, should an evacuation be considered. So those are my uh, sort of suggestions for community response, many of which I think uh, you'll see that's already uh, in play at PGR and in CRAS. Personal resiliency. So there's a number of steps people can take. Um, first of all, we, uh, you know, knowing what the air quality is, and that's the work of the air sheds, making sure it's available on a variety of uh, platforms. I think using the AQHI app is, is excellent. And of course, the AQHI app also provides forecasts, not just current readings. And I think that's very helpful. Um, this one may seem like a no brainer, but, but it is important to note there are health guidelines provided when AQHI is high uh, and it really should be followed. It, it's very important information. Um, being that we're two plus years out of a pandemic, uh, I think we're familiar with masks now. So masks can be worn as well for wildfire smoke and um, and there's some, you know different literature on which ones are the best but uh, I think having a, a good mask n95 for example uh, if it has proper sealing is very good for those that have um, health issues like asthma COPD uh, should have their own uh, action plans and be able to put those into play um, you can create a, a clean air shelter within your home. Uh, there's lots of suggestions on how to do that. Um, and so that, that is something that makes sense. Um, this one I like is try to recommend over use of electricity because um, we're going to need, a, there's going to be more dependency on air, air filtration and air conditioning. Um, so we don't want to overwhelm uh, the grid because then we could actually have brownouts or blackouts. Um, avoid burning wood and uh and using barbecues and cutting the grass uh i it amazes me how many people uh, will have wood burning um fires during bad air quality days so i think that's part of part of public messaging and hopefully uh, in future bylaws as well 
And lastly, just avoid adding to your indoor air pollution. So if you're sheltering from bad air quality due to wildfire smoke, one ought not to have candles burning in fireplaces, and, but even vacuuming, again, dust. So my last slide, we're, we're, how, what does the future hold? Well, we know the climate is, is changing. We, we can expect more droughts, severe weather, uh, with that increasing wildfire smoke events, uh, and from that, poor air quality. So there will be impacts um, on people, animals, the environment. We can see, we can look forward to more disruptions uh, and potentially economic impacts. So I do think this needs to rise in, 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 uh, in community thinking and planning. Um, and so I think this is a, a very good topic to, to move forward. I, what's interesting, I think, is when we have a summer with little wildfire smoke, we, we find some of the planning tends to regress a little bit. So I, I hate to say it, but the events actually help in the uh, interest level at times. Julie, I ask you for timing. This is a one minute video from the Airshed Council. Do you want me to? Yeah. Go for it. Okay, hopefully it works. The frequency of large wildfires throughout Western North America is increasing, and experts suggest that this trend is likely to continue. Wildfire smoke is harmful to your health because it contains increased amounts of fine particulate matter, small particles one-eighth the size of a human hair. Inhaling smoke is more damaging to people who have cardiovascular or respiratory issues and to children, pregnant women, or the elderly. You can make a difference on a smoky day by reducing your exposure to outdoor air and your own emissions. Download the AQHI app to stay up to date on air quality in your area. The app will let you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, how clean the air is outdoors. A lower number means cleaner air. Find out more information about air quality from your local airshed organization and protect your health when air quality is poor. And that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Gary, for that presentation and for kind of pulling together all the pieces into one. You've done a great job of summarizing things for me. So that's great. Um, what I'd like to do now is we've got 15 minutes left in our webinar and we will take some time for some questions. So I have been watching uh, Facebook as well as the Q&A here. Please don't be shy. We have folks um, joining us from a whole multitude of different backgrounds and sectors. Um, so there's, there's no bad question. To sort of kick us off, I want to get back to something that Kim had mentioned back in your presentation. You had talked about uh, you know, Prince George kind of being in that bowl and how even in the winter that can impact the air quality. Um, so if you could touch on a little bit more about that and then Gary and, and Jill, not to totally put you on the spot, but if you could speak to maybe some of the causes of poor air quality days in the winter in the context of, you know, sort of the Calgary and then Alberta Capital Airshed, West Central Airshed region. So Kim first, and then over to, to Jill and Gary. Sure, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, you know, we know that air quality is, or air pollution is sort of affected by not just sources, but also meteorology, topography, things like that. So in our case, uh, the topography of our city means that um, in the a common occurrence in the wintertime is where there's an air, a layer of sort of cold air close to the ground. And then there's a layer of warmer air over top of that. It's called an inversion. Typically what we see is warmer air close to the ground and colder as you go up higher. But when it's a really clear, um, still like high pressure system, a lot of times we do get these inversions, which then uh, prevent mixing of those atmospheric layers and then the pollutants kind of get trapped close to the ground. So some people choose to live in the more upland areas to avoid those kinds of um, that exposure to those pollutants in the we call it the bowl um, in the bowl area. But um, it, it, they do happen. That's, so that's a natural feature of Prince George and really has, has nothing to do with any management action that we can enact. Um, but that means that we have to be more vigilant sources in those kind, especially in those kinds of circumstances. 
Great, thanks, Kim. Um, Jill, Jill, are you comfortable going next around speaking to the, the winter, you know, sources of it, poor air days? Sure, um, similar to, to Kim's area, Kras has a, a bit of a topography bowl as well. And it is the inversions in the winter that we experience more uh, poor air quality days. Um, we see it, we also have a closer to the mountains and we have an, in, uh, you know, a reaction from them. But uh, like I say, similar to the Prince George area, it's the bowl and it's the inversions in the winter. Great, thanks, Jill. Over to you, Gary. I'm gonna sound like a broken record. Bowls, inversions, um, you know, the same, right? So for West Central, if you think about our population centers of, um, Hinton, Edson, Drayton Valley, White Court, um, all have some topography issues, um, which which lead to inversions. I think um, a lot of wood burning uh, residentially. They have pulp mills. They have a lot of diesel vehicles. I mean, all this stuff gets trapped. It gets it, it interacts with each other. So there's chemical reactions going on and then coming back on people. So then if I take my other hat off and talk about sort of the big city with the Alberta Capital Air Shed, that plus everything else, plus, you know, major industry um, and uh, a lot more cars. So um, Edmonton actually was one of the first uh, areas in Alberta to identify the uh, issue of wintertime smog. And there are plans built on, on that already. So it has been a concern for many years. Great, thanks. Um, one one question here is, would Gary please share the link to the video? So Gary, I'm just gonna put you on the spot. If you have it handy, throw it in the chat there. Otherwise we'll make sure to get that out to everybody in an email afterwards. Unintended commercial number three, you can join the Alberta Capital Airshed and West Central Airshed mailing lists, and then you get links to all of these things regularly. Um, you can also follow us on social media and check out our websites. Okay, there we go. Unintended commercial number three. Uh, next question that we have um, from an attendee is regarding the future of air quality monitoring, how would you see the importance of smaller scale consumer and commercial air quality monitors? And could they help with issues of people not adhering to advisories? So I think there's a few different pieces to that question. One is around, you know, those, those tiny monitors that people can just order and put in themselves, but then also um, you know, some of the commercial ones and, um, and you know, sort of the, the implications and benefits of, of that. So let's go to Gary and then we'll punt it over to Jill and then Kim. Yeah, I mean, I know that all three of us um, are working with Environment Canada, Climate Change Canada and, and installing purple errors and, and sort of micro sensors for particulate matter. Um, and in and the Alberta Capital Shed, we've actually used a whole bunch of other sensors as well. So I think these things are great, frankly. Uh, they need to be done, though, uh, properly so that they are cited appropriately and they, they're come with um, education. I think they're great. Uh, and so we see, I mean, in, in the Alberta Capital Shed, I think we're operating about 50 of them now. Uh, and in West Central, we're starting to put them in some communities that don't have either air monitoring. Um, and I'll just finished by saying we're currently the Alberta Capital Air Shed and Alberta Environment and Parks are doing a one-year pilot on a, on, a, on a sensor array. So it's actually the AQHI parameters of a, of a um, smaller unit that uh, hopefully will be able to provide air quality health index um, through all the channels for a community that will never see a full continuous monitoring station. So that's kind of the hope of this pilot. And we're piloting currently in the city of Leduc for one year. Great, thanks, Gary. And just before we get to Jill, I also put a link to in West Central Airshed. Um, if anybody wants to apply to to host a Purple Air monitor, that they can get in touch with us, and and we can you know help facilitate that conversation. And I will also post a link to uh, last month's webinar, which was all about citizen science um, and a project that some students at the U of A Augustana are doing to monitor air quality using these microsensors in the city of Camrose. Okay, over to you, Jill. Uh, I would agree with Gary. The, uh, the small purple air sensors are a great complement when continuous ambient stations, the large ones, uh, 
aren't financially feasible or location wise. We have about 24 to 26 purple airs throughout our region that are just between either Crasbot or the project that Gary mentioned with Environment Canada. Um, I would agree with Gary, but go one more step that we need to also in siting properly and making sure that they're, you know, installed properly, talk about the limitations of them compared to continuous monitoring. Um, they are not, as my technical committee tells me many times, they are not the end all to be all, but they are a complement. And so that's how we view them. We do want more of them. In the CRAS region, the ones that we have are in our more outlying areas, not so much in the city of Calgary, because the city of Calgary has three continuous stations. Uh, but I do feel that they're, they're important. And what they do more than, I think, in our region give data, which they do, uh, is that they build the awareness and the education of the public about air quality. We've always said, that we make the invisible visible. When you, keep, when you look outside, it's a clear blue sky and there's no inversions in the winter or fire in the summer. People don't think about the air until you tell them to stop breathing. And what does that do for them? And then they start to relate it. So that's where CRAS is, is that we use them to get the data, but we also, they're a huge uh, engagement outreach tool for us. Yeah, great, Jill. That's a good good reminder, right? It's a bit of a balance there in terms of what are the benefits of each one. Kim, do you have anything to add to the, the monitor question? Sure. Um, yeah, I do. And uh, so thank you, Jill. I really appreciate you mentioning the need to um, be really clear about limitations because, you know, in this age of disinformation and misinformation, using purple air monitors to say, hey, look how terrible the air is or whatever is, is a source of misinformation because it's not accurate. In, and, um, and those who monitor air quality really understand that, but perhaps there's a disconnect between what we're sharing and, and the way people are, are seeking that information. Um, but I do wanna say that in terms of um, those gaps that we see in monitoring, those purple airs in our community have been instrumental in helping understand the dispersion of PM 2.5 within the community. Um, and um, it's just, those are little, just little ways that they help uh, the, fill in the big picture um, and certainly don't replace the, the larger provincially run monitors. Yeah, great, thanks for that. Sort of, um, you know, an another question that we've had come in is, how does outdoor air quality affect the indoor air quality? So I think this gets a little bit to the clean air shelters piece. And then I have another quick follow-up on that idea of creating your own clean air shelter at home. So for this one, uh, we'll go to Jill first and then Kim and then Gary. So the question is, how does that outdoor, outdoor air quality affect our indoor air quality in our homes and offices and schools and all of that? Well, on a day of an event, you want to make sure that all your windows are closed, all your doors are closed, um, that you're not, uh, that you're recirculating the air within the house or the building, whatever you want to call it, and not pulling air in from outside because it does affect it. Um, we have a whole section, I'll plug the guide, do those cheap little advertisements um, on air quality how the two of them are related and what to do when you're indoors and how to protect yourselves from the outdoor air quality. Uh, that's all, that's, uh, that's, I'll leave it at that. Great, thanks. And then I think I had said over to Kim. Sure, I'll, I'll just absolutely agree. We don't actually, um, indoor air quality isn't part of our uh, strategic plan. However, people do need to consider the full spectrum of their exposure to pollutants and how much indoor air quality can uh, contribute to or how much indoor air pollution, cooking, you know, if you've got a, a fireplace or a wood burning appliance in your home, how much that can contribute to your overall exposure. So if you already have an underlying condition, um, then that can be exacerbated not by your neighbor burning leaves, but by your own wood, wood stove. 
Great, thanks, Kim and Gary. Anything else? Yeah, I mean, I, just to say that uh, we know that indoor air quality is typically worse than outdoor air quality, but th that can change during event times. And uh, um, the Alberta Capital Airship is doing a project with the University of Alberta to install sensors in and out just to understand better um, what the relationship is as uh, during event days, during wildfire smoke event days, to see which buildings are, are better at um, you know keeping the smoke out and actually filtering air. Great, thanks. And can can I just get you to Gary? Maybe you can just quickly distinguish for us the difference between ambient air monitoring and point source monitoring, and and that idea of you know purple air can highlight issues related to point source, and allow us to identify potentially uh, you know specific issues. So again, a little bit more about ambient air monitoring versus that point source monitoring, just to make it. A little bit more clear for anybody who's listening in. Julie, sorry, is that for me? Yes, me. please, if you could. Okay, yeah. uh, okay well, point source uh, means that you have a single source of emission, uh, and we're trying to understand what that is and how that's influencing, um, you know, the greater community. Where ambient is more just monitoring the air quality that we're breathing, um, and so uh, air sheds do uh, a bit of both, frankly. Um, I think sensors also can do a bit of both, and I think they can be very helpful. Um, we know that um, if you have a, a large single source emitter with one continuous station that can pick up, uh, that can be very helpful, but it can also miss a lot of the emissions depending on meteorology. So I think using sensors is very helpful. We did it. Um, we did it. Lehigh Cement did it actually. The big cement factory in Yellowhead uh, Trail in Edmonton did it through um, equipping their staff with wearable air sensors and then having that data stream live. Um, so I think, you know, there's opportunities to use sensors in, in really great ways. Uh, I totally agree with what uh, Jill and Kim were talking about, the, the, the limitations, but I think if you use them to supplement um, uh, other monitoring, it can be very helpful. And I'm just gonna say, I think for both point and ambient. Great, thanks for that. I'm conscious of our time. It's the, the hour just flew by. So before we, close out today, I would um, like to acknowledge a couple of folks who've been working behind the scenes on today's webinar. So Russ Miyagawa has been providing technical support on Zoom and elsewhere throughout the, the webinar here today. And Serena Tang, who will be putting together some great post webinar social media posts. So I do encourage you to watch for those. I'd also like to just acknowledge and thank the other air sheds and other organizations out there who did help to share information about this event. We really appreciate that support in that outreach. And um, I will pass the microphone back over to each of our panelists. If you have one last closing remark or closing word you'd like to say, and, um, and then we'll call it a wrap. So let's, let's go and order a presentation. Over to you, Kim, first. Well, I just want to say thanks so much. Um, I have failed to acknowledge the Klaylee Tanae's unceded territory on whose lands we work and live and play. Um, and um, I think just in engaging all sectors of the community is, uh, is the most important piece because, you know, we're all receptors for the air pollution. Thanks very much for having me. Really great, uh, great format that I think PGR could look at um, implementing something like this. So thanks again. Wonderful. Well, thank you for your contribution today. Um, you, you sparked a lot of uh, interest from everybody who was uh, listening in today. Over to you, Jill. Last word from um, I just want to Thank you for having us and uh, to encourage everyone to watch for the CRAS website for the unveiling of the guide. It, has a, it will have a lot of resources that uh, will help whomever in Alberta and can be applicable. And there's a lot in there that are Canada wide as well. So thank you. Great, thanks, Jill and Gary. Sure, so uh, big thanks to Kim and Jill, of course, but also to their organizations for sort of leading the way on this. So the Alberta Capital Air Shed has started a little bit of work around building a community guide. Uh, and, you know, thanks to PGA and Kraz, we have, um, we have good lessons to learn from. And um, so we're, we're hopeful to get that moving and in West Central, uh, we'll be seeing one as well. So I think uh, it's, it's, uh, it's helpful, this kind of conversation, because 
uh, it really uh, will allow us to build our own guides as well. Thank you. Yeah, great, Gary, thank you. It really gets to this idea of collaboration. So thank you to our panelists for joining us today, sharing your, your thoughts and your wisdom from your organizations and to everybody who joined us. Quick reminder, June 20th is our next webinar where we will be exploring that relationship between climate change and air quality. Again, you can find the registration link in the chat. With that, have a good afternoon, everybody. Bye-bye.